Hello everyone and welcome to this first in a series of videos on Diophantus. Diophantus is a sort of granddaddy of the field of algebra. His name lives on there in Diophantine equations, Diophantine analysis. Over the course of this series I want to introduce you to most of the main problem solving ideas from Diophantus's original work and we'll see that in many ways they're very different from the modern operations that go under his name but hopefully you'll agree with me that his maths has a different sort of attraction, especially in the art with which he came up with cunning substitutions to solve his problems. In this opening video, we'll set the scene by talking about his work and also about how we know about it. So Diophantus was a mathematician from Alexandria in the north of Egypt. We have very little evidence about his dates, though one source suggests that his work was already being re-edited by about 260 CE, so he must have been at least a few decades before that. Um, most people place him in the second or the early third century CE. At that time, Egypt was part of the Roman Empire, but much of the intellectual life in Alexandria, which was the capital of the province, was still conducted in Greek. And in fact, the city had been a major hub for science within the Greek speaking parts of the Mediterranean for a good four or 500 years by that point. We're not sure what Diophantus called his main work, but the conventional title is the Arithmetica, based on a phrase he uses to describe what he's up to, problemata arithmetica. And you can probably see that we're dealing here with the roots of the English words problem and arithmetic, but Diophantus is not doing what we'd call arithmetic. In Greek, the phrase means something like problems to do with finding numbers, putting a value on quantities. And it's important to realise that when Diophantus talks about numbers, what he means in modern terms is quite specific, positive rational numbers. He isn't interested in zero or minus one or root two or pi or anything like that, just natural numbers and their ratios. The Arithmetica was a set of problems with solutions addressed to a student called Dionysius with a very nice cover letter that explains how Dionysius is bound to find them difficult, but he has to try not to get dispirited, something I think any math student can relate to. We know from that cover letter that the Arithmetica originally had 13 main sections, which we call books, but they're much, much smaller than that might suggest. Um, the division into 13 was perhaps designed to match the 13 original books of Euclid's Elements. Over the course of the work, there's a clear gradation. The concepts and methods get more complex and Diophantus solutions also start to demand a lot more from the reader who's trying to follow along. Now, unfortunately, not all of the Arithmetica survives. We have Greek copies arranged in six books and there was a 9th century Arabic translation arranged in seven of which uh, books four to seven still survive. And when these are all put together, it seems certain that we have the first three sections of Diophantus' work, much as he conceived it. After that, it's a reasonable assumption that the Arabic translation carried on sequentially. And then there's definite evidence that there's a bit missing where Diophantus would have given a general method, uh, method for solving quadratic equations. The last three preserved books in the Greek presuppose knowledge about how to do quadratic equations. They must have come from somewhere within books 9 to 13 of the original. The Arabic translation that I mentioned there was made around 870 CE by Kusta ibn Luka. Please excuse me if I may do the pronunciation wrong. Uh, under the Arabic form lies a Greek name. Effectively, he's Kostas, son of Luke. And he came from Baalbek, which had had a long Greek past, though in the 9th century, it had been under Arabic control for a couple of centuries. He seems to have been invited to Baghdad to join the very active efforts that were going on there to translate Greek philosophical and scientific texts into Arabic. This translation allowed Diophantus to have some impact on the developments in algebra in the medieval Arabic world, where he was read by scholars like al Karaji. And it was from Arabic algebra that some Diophantine ideas first filtered into Western Europe via figures like Fibonacci in the early 13th century. Meanwhile, in Constantinople, Diophantus was being read in Greek, 
The earliest surviving manuscript dates to around 1075, and that was the subject of study throughout the 13th century. But it was actually only much later that the Greek text was translated into Latin or published in its own right so that it could be studied by mathematicians, including Fermat in the 17th century, and then Newton, Euler, and many others. In fact, Fermat's last theorem supposedly started life as an annotation in his copy of Diophantus. Then the last massive development in the understanding of Diophantus' work came in the 1970s with the rediscovery at Mashhad in Iran of a copy of Kusti ibn Nurka's long lost translation. And so suddenly we got those four extra books of Diophantus to study as recently as 1975. Well, that brings this introductory video to a close. In the next one, we'll look at how Diophantus methods compare to some of the basics of modern algebra. I hope you'll join me for that and do share this video if you found it interesting.